Today we're gonna to break down why top end speed is becoming essentially a junk metric and really doesn't matter nearly as much in the game of hockey and instead the one thing your player must be able to do. This is Hockey Talk with John Swanson and you'll see our players and alumni in the USHL playing collegiate hockey, AHL, NHL, and the Olympics. Now today we're gonna to focus a lot on simply the skating stride. On top of it, I'm gonna break down some exercise you can do at home to give your athlete a better mechanical advantage so that they can skate better. Now, we're also gonna pull back the curtain on some old school thoughts that just aren't really as relevant anymore. And so when we look at the skating stride, the first thing I wanna understand and kind of pull back the curtain on is top end speed. It used to be this golden metric. And the truth is I put a ton of energy in it as a player. I was skating on treadmills, hiring skating coaches, all after this idea that I had to skate faster. And what was interesting is as I progressed up the ranks in hockey, my top end speed really mattered less and less and less. And there was something that mattered a lot more. And the reason this happens is because there's only so fast that you can skate and kids catch up. And that's why you see somebody that's like a really fast skater at squirts if they don't progress this one thing in their stride, they tend to fall off. Top end speed is not the end all metric, but what is? Well, that's what we're gonna break down. So before we jump into that, let's look at Connor McDavid versus your son or daughter. Your son or daughter takes about nine strides to 12 from blue line to blue line, meaning their foot will hit the ice roughly nine to 12 times to cover blue to blue. Connor McDavid, roughly four to five. That's a 50% reduction in stride usage. Why does that matter? Well, at a youth level, we primarily teach forward skating, so linear skating, or we teach the crossover. And the reason why we do this is because it is the biggest, essentially bang for your buck at an early age, because that's how the game's played. Simply put, you can take the puck wide, and if you're the fastest skater on the ice, you can kind of just beat everybody to the net and you score goals. However, that starts to fade, and here's the problem. When I work with our college or even pro players that have not developed the other strides, they're kind of behind and they tend to struggle. That's right, other strides. So there's roughly anywhere from nine to 10 plus different strides players will use at an NHL level. And very rarely are they using the linear stride. Simply put, the elite hockey game is not played linearly, it's played laterally. And so here's the one thing that I want you to take away. Your player's ability to continue to progress into Bantams, high school, junior A, and college and pro is gonna be their ability to decelerate and their ability to move laterally. That will help them um, more so than top end speed. So if you have to choose what to prioritize, how quick can they stop and recelerate or how quickly can they move laterally? And there's tons of different strides. There's things like an anchor, a soft drag, our 10 and twos, our punch turns, our cross unders, our shuffle steps, just to name a few. Now, the second side of this is the thought around the hollow of the skate. Now, I could do a whole different video of how to set up steel for a skate and the theories behind it, but understand that if a player's skate is too sharp, they're not actually able to, per, able to decelerate the way they need to, and they're not able to move laterally because the ice is creating too much friction. The other thing that's really interesting about hollow setup is that NHL has done a tremendous amount of studies and they've actually broken down that when the player's skate is at a half or sharper, there was a 60% increase in likelihood of hip and groin injury. On top of it, when a player is at a five ace and above hollow, so a shallow or hollow, they, it was like they played six less minutes in an NHL game. Now the average player in the NHL as a forward plays roughly 13 to 14 minutes, six minutes, is almost 40% of playing time. That's a massive amount when you take it over, say a 30 gamer in the NHL in 82 game season. That's way less playing time. It saves the body, it allows them to be more efficient and more energy. And the player that is fresher in the third period is gonna have more success. On top of it, they're also gonna be safer because they're less fatigued. And with concussions being so important and part of this day's uh, this day and age of the game, it's important that our players are as fresh as possible so they can protect themselves and score goals. So the hollow plays a major part of the thought and theory. 
And so this idea that we want to cut in the ice, or you'll hear even coaches say, I want you, I want to hear your skates has now changed to, I don't want to hear your skates. I want to hear you glide on the ice. I want to hear you slide on the ice. And that's something that we work a lot on with our players is the actual ability to slide on one foot or two feet. If the skate's too sharp, they can't do it. But once they get to the right hollow and they learn their balance, now they're able to control their edges and they ultimately can control when they want to decelerate, which is really important. The next one is they can glide. So they actually can get more out of one stride, which looks like they're not moving their feet as fast, but they're actually covering the same amount of ground. And often they're actually doing it much faster with less effort. All of it is going to give them the mechanical advantage. All right. So that being said, first, Youth is teaching a lot of linear and crossovers, which is fine, but the problem is if they don't learn the other strides, they're gonna fall behind, especially when they get to Bantams in high school. The second part is the skate setup is changing. We're moving away from a super deep hollow to a much more uh, flatter steel and um, ultimately a less uh, deep hollow so that they can glide and slide. Now, that being said, I wanna break down, and I have two images teed up. The first one is a NHL player and I'm going to break down the skating position for your son or daughter to be an elite level hockey player or to simply progress in their skating position. They have to understand heel pressure. Heel pressure is a little bit different than the gliding position. But when we get into this wide stance, they have to be able to control their heel pressure. They have to be able to get into a forward uh, angle in their shin. They have to be able to get in this Y angle, ultimately in the ice, which is really, really on the inside edge. They have to be able to stay stable and wide base, um, ultimately understand where to put their glove so they can allow themselves to either shoot, pass, or deke. And then finally, they have to be able to do all of this in a real relaxed position. And so if you watch the NHL game, they're actually in this position more than they are in a linear stride. Now, the second part of this is what does proper skating mechanics look like? Well, again, you see this Y angle of the ankle. You see the knee bend at a 90 degree plus, if not more. You see the knee over the toe. This is, you see a proper upline of the torso. And so the first thing that is really, really important is, can your son or daughter even get into the proper mechanical positions? If they can't, no worries. I'm gonna give you some things to do at home that will help them get the mechanical advantage. Let's start at the foot. So if I were to have you sprint, mom or dad have to go sprint right now in front of everybody. And I say, you have option one is sprint on concrete. Option two is you got to sprint on the sand. Which one's going to be faster? You would say concrete. And this is 100% true. So think about this. You can have two players that have the same amount of leg strength. However, their ability to apply force to the ground. So power is radically different based off of one thing. That is their foot, their actual arch strength. And so I'm going to tee up here some exercises that you could do at home. Um, you don't have to get crazy with it, but just even introducing, you know, uh, five to 10 seconds twice a day will make a radical difference over time. Again, we're not solving any of this stuff overnight, over a week or even a month. It does take time. So we have to strengthen the arch. If a player's got strong legs, but they got weak arches, they can't apply as much force. They're going to be slower. The second thing now is great ankle mobility and hip mobility. So this kind of starts to all go together. So we have the ankle here, we have the knee mobility and we have the hip mobility. So things like glute bridges, but also just getting them to be more athletic. So there's two components here. When our son or daughter plays things like soccer or softball or flag football um, or sports out in the yard, they are becoming better athletes. And why that matters is that puts them in different positions, which ultimately creates a better range of motion for the hip, the knee and the ankle to be in. If you look at any college or NHL team and you get those players outside of the arena and you say, let's go play soccer or let's go play uh, flag football, they're naturally good athletes. They're athletes first, hockey players second. And so I'm a big believer that our athletes at the youth level need to play other sports because it teaches their body to get in other positions. It also gives them an absolute mental reprieve from the grind of the rink, which is so true. So the second part is we need to be able to get the knee to get over the toe so that we can get into that forward lean. So again, glute bridges, but also just being an athlete are going to help. And I'll tee that up, as I said, in the description below. The next one is for us to reach our stride power is holding a midline, right? So as we're skating and we accelerate and we decelerate, it is our midline that wants to collapse 
because of all the g-forces. So it requires actually a lot of strength. And the fact that I just used the word g-force, you're like, what? G-force? You're thinking of a fighter pilot. Yes, hockey players, when they are decelerating, it takes three as much as three times the amount of strength it does to accelerate. They have to be really strong. And strong specifically in their hips, their legs, but also their midline. And so you see a lot of these players that are hunched over, and it's because they lack abdominal, um, oblique, and then erector strength. So how do we fix that? Well, we can do it by planks and side planks, stuff that they do already with their school. And so incorporating an environment where, you know, they do 20 second planks with their team or even at home will start to help them stabilize that midline, which is going to allow them to decelerate better and then move laterally. And so here is our kind of skating example. We see that Y angle, we see the knee angle, we see the arm drive, we see also the, the ankle and the knee and the hip positioning, and then the head posture. And so I've gone over in the video a little bit of some things that we can do at home. Again, I'll tee up some examples. With any athlete, the key here is never to get crazy with it, right? Ease your player into it. There are many different ages, um, and the goal is at at the end of the day, they have to love the game. So if you're forcing them to do all these things, you got to figure out a way to make it fun, right? So if you can play a game with it, they're going to be much more engaged. So as you work with your son or daughter at home, or if you're a coach and you're working with your players at the rink, remember, they're young, they're youth. We need to be able to understand all of this knowledge. We have to digest it and then we have to figure out, okay, how do we use this, but in an environment where it doesn't feel like work to the kids that it feels exciting. Otherwise, we're going to lose them. We don't want to lose them at an early age. We want to continue to develop. We just want to do it in the right way. So big takeaways today. The game is no longer linear. That's a junk metric. It is about deceleration and lateral movement. For that to happen, we have to have great athletes first. Secondly, we have to have strong arches and uh, good range of motion in the ankle, the knee, and the hip. And then we have to have a strong midline. From there, then leg strength starts to matter more. But if we don't have those things, we're going to struggle. Next, hockey is not just played with the linear or the crossover. There's many different strides that requires you to work with uh, a skating expert, right? And somebody that's able to teach heel pressure and um, uh, as I like to call them, um, you know, soft drags and anchors and our 10 and twos and all these different strides. We want to introduce them at an early age, not when they get to high school or junior, because they've had so many years skating in these strides, it's hard to reprogram their body. So if we do it at an early age, they're now going to have all the strides they need to continue to progress because the game, as we know it at a might level is all linear, but as they get higher and higher and higher, the game actually shifts to much more of a lateral game. So there you have it. That's X7 Hockey Talk. And today we broke down everything that I believe is important inside of the skating stride and how the game is uh, radically shifted when it comes to skating as a whole. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out. And if you found this valuable, please share it with a hockey family or a fellow coach.